Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna to give everyone just a minute to get logged on. I see the numbers kind of rolling in. Thank you for joining us here today. If you're from Florida, you're enjoying this beautiful weather and we know so many of you are from out of town in different service areas. So we thank you so much for finding Neuro Challenge and for tuning in today. All right. Today's webinar, we are very, very excited about. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with myself or Neuro Challenge, I'm Chelsea Dooley. We are very happy to have um, our guests here today. Let's see here. Oh yeah, we have lots of folks connected here. So let me do just a quick screen share. And again, good morning for those of you who are just now getting tuned in and connected. My name is Chelsea Dooley. I am the Senior Care Advisor for Neuro Challenge Foundation for Parkinson's. We are very excited about today's presentation through the We and PD planning, preparing, and partnering together for long-term neurological illness. This is our second session of this We and PD program. We are very excited. This program is made possible by Supertis Pharmaceuticals, and we have with us here. Um, Dr. Terry Ellis, Sal Fontana, who is our care partner, and Ellen Schaller, who is my fellow coworker and care advisor with NeuroChallenge. NeuroChallenge Foundation, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is a nonprofit organization, meaning that we provide all of our services free of charge to our community. This program today is a little bit different and very special for us because it was designed and developed by local neuro challenge caregivers. In total, 18 of them were responsible for compiling ideas and thoughts together, which is collectively reflected in over 225 years of caregiving experience. So that gives you a little reflection on why we chose the topics that we did for this series. The report that they created generated lots of suggestions and we thank all of you who shared your experiences to help put together this program today. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Terry Ellis about her team's work with Parkinson's disease, exercise, and physical therapy. I would like to ask you all to take a look at the bottom of your screen. You will see a Q&A button, and throughout Dr. Ellis's presentation, you are welcome to submit questions through that Q&A box. And at the end of her presentation, we will have time for some Q&A. There's also a chat function on the bottom. So if anyone is having any technical issues, questions about Zoom specifically, you can put that right in the chat throughout the presentation and I will do my best to um, help you through that issue. So I'll be back at the conclusion of the program to let you know um, some more things and Ellen's going to help with that about how you can take Dr. Ellis's suggestions and implement them into your own life. So now I would like to go ahead and introduce our care partner who is Sal Fontana, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about himself and his story. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Chelsea. Hello, I'm Sal Fontana, and I am a caregiver for my wife, Mary, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease nine years ago. It was very disconcerting as you may know. Once we wrapped our minds around it, we looked for help regarding its progression. We learned about NeuroChallenge five years ago. Through NeuroChallenge, she was introduced to the big and loud program that improved her gait. She has followed this with an increase in her exercise regime. About four years ago, she joined a Parkinson's disease boxing exercise group at Jayco's Boxing and Fitness Gym, and it has been very beneficial. She has recently incorporated uh, physical therapy three times a week. Now, as you can imagine, she calls for me and I stand up and I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> She's really fit. One of the, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> One of the additional benefits of the group boxing sessions is the opportunity to socialize with other individuals with Parkinson's disease. They are constantly learning to advising each other and helping each other. Mary's stamina, gait, and balance have improved and remain so. One of the benefits she has noticed 
from the exercising is the ability to smell coffee and other odors that she could not smell before. There's no one better to make the case for exercise than Dr. Terry Ellis, associate professor and chair of the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training at Boston University's College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Ellis also is a board certified specialist in neurological physical therapy. Dr. Ellis also directs the Center for Neuro Rehabilitation at Boston University, where she conducts research and provides clinical consultations and education to people with neurological disorders. In addition, she directs the American Parkinson's Disease Association's National Rehabilitation Resource Center housed at Boston University. Dr. Ellis will discuss research showing the impact of exercise on PD, how to target your specific motor needs, and the benefits of starting regular exercise right now. Do it now. Welcome, Dr. Ellis. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sal. Much appreciated. I'm just going to try to share my screen now. Okay. All right. Everybody see that? I can. All right, perfect. Okay, so let's get to it. You know, I'm excited to be here today. I know exercise is a hot topic for everybody. And uh, there are some people out there who are really, um, you know, avid exercisers and who love it and who really are excited to engage. And there are other people who will struggle, other people who really want to be doing it, but aren't quite doing uh, what they intend to do. So I'm going to try to cover both ends of the spectrum here today. And uh, I'm going to share some of the research, uh, you know, showing the, how beneficial exercise is, you know, for people with Parkinson's disease. Okay. So when I see people with Parkinson's disease in our center, I, you know, the, the sort of question I get from people is, well, what is the big deal? What is the impact that exercise actually has on Parkinson's disease? Because we all know exercise is beneficial for everybody, right? For multiple reasons. But what's so special about it in Parkinson's disease? Well, there's been several studies done in animal models of Parkinson's disease. And it's in these studies in, in, of animal models that we've learned about the potential benefits of exercise on the brain. So if you see over in this side here, generally what happens in these studies is that they have rats or mice that are running on a wheel. So most of it is aerobic exercise, you know, breathing heavy, working hard. And you can see over here in this particular study, they found an increase in, they call GDNF levels, it's a certain chemical. Basically, these are neurochemicals in the brain that are thought to be, that are thought to help protect uh, sick cells from dying. You know, so that the, the cells that are targeted in the, in the substantia nigra area in Parkinson's disease are, are, are partly protected by exercise because of the increase in these chemicals in the brain. And so, we also see over here in some other studies that there's more dopamine available with exercise. So dopamine is, there's an increase in dopamine release with exercise uh, so that the brain has access to more of the dopamine, which is typically missing or reduced in Parkinson's. So there's lots of studies in animal models that show some really sort of uh, really uh, robust you know, changes in the brain, uh, improvements in brain function. And so the big question is, what does that mean to people? You know, what does that mean to humans with Parkinson's disease? How does it actually translate? So what we know in humans, uh, so the difficult thing is there's no, there's no biomarker in Parkinson's disease. In, so what, what I mean by that is there's not a specific way to measure the the change in disease progression over time. You know, there's not a precise enough way to measure that. So we sort of go about it indirectly. And what we know in people with Parkinson's disease is that exercise here, exercise meaning practice of the task, 
things like walking. So people with Parkinson's disease have trouble walking and practicing that particular task among others helps to shape the brain. And so does things like aerobic exercise. Just like in the animal models, right? Increasing that heart rate, getting more blood flow to the brain is very helpful. And so what we see over here on the right is the changes in brain health. We see better blood flow. We see better metabolism. We see those neurotrophic factors that we saw in animal models. There's an increase in those chemicals in the brain in people with Parkinson's disease. So again, that's thought to you know, protect those cells uh, you know, that are affected in Parkinson's disease. We also know over here on the left, we see changes that are more specific to Parkinson's disease. These little things here on the axon, these little things sticking out here, these are synapses that make it easier for cells to communicate, for neurons to communicate with each other. So if you take all of these things here, the synapse changes and the brain health, you get better function of the circuits, the motor circuits the, that help with movement in the brain. And that leads to better behavior, meaning you know, reduced motor symptoms, better cognition and thinking, even better mood and motivation. So that's a little bit of the background, but I think what people are, re what I hear the most <laughs> from, from when I see people with Parkinson's disease, I would say the single most common question I get is what is the, what kind of exercise is best? Tell me the one that I'm supposed to be doing. You know, what is the exact program? And so there's no one best. That's the thing. It depends on the goal. It depends on what we're, you know, what you're trying to achieve. And it also depends on that person's individual profile. You know, the challenges and the, you know, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease that each person faces, right? So I'm gonna talk about that here. So in general, what are the key exercise categories, right? Here are the exercise categories on the left. So it is very important uh, these, you know, these, these different categories of exercise are all important for different reasons. So aerobic exercise, right? That's the kind of exercise where you're walking briskly and that might be on a treadmill or, or overground walking, you know, walking outside or maybe cycling or, or as Sal mentioned earlier, boxing. Some aspects of boxing are aerobic. Your heart rate is sweating, you're a little out of breath, right? It's, uh, you know, you're working hard. And then you know, things like strength training and strength training can be done in different ways with using weights or machines or uh, elastic bands. And then there's balance training, very important in Parkinson's disease. And there's various ways we can get at that, which we're gonna talk about. Stretching can be an important element of the exercise program. And then this task specific training or movement strategy training, which I'll talk about. So I'm gonna go into these in a little more depth. So what do we mean by aerobic exercise, right? We mean working hard, sweating, a little out of breath. And, you know, and these can be done, like I said, in different ways, walking on a treadmill, a stationary bike, for example. So why, how do you know what to choose? You know, how do you know what to choose? What are the benefits of walking on a treadmill? Well, walking on a treadmill can help with the aerobic exercise. So you can get that aerobic exercise workout right? That helps those chemicals in the brain increase, right? And the other benefit of walking on a treadmill is that it helps walking. It helps the task of walking. So people walk faster, take bigger steps. Those of you that notice that when you're walking, your walking might feel like it slows down over time, or the steps get smaller, or you sort of peter out over time. Well, that's the advantage of a treadmill. The treadmill doesn't let you do that right? Because the belt stays at a constant speed. So people with Parkinson's disease, when they have to stay on the belt and walk at a certain rate, the treadmill doesn't allow you to slow down. You have to keep up, right? And that facilitates bigger steps and faster walking speed, which is exactly what we want to promote in Parkinson's, right? So that's why treadmills can be really, really helpful. There's also studies showing that just outdoor walking, walking in the community is beneficial. So here's a study where people walk three times a week for 45 minutes 
outside, you know, with a with a with moderate intensity. So the heart rate was 70% of heart rate max, which means like a little out of breath, a, sort of a brisk walk. And in this study, this was done over six months. So people with Parkinson's walked three times a week over six months, like a brisk walking pace. And in this study, they found significant improvements in fitness level, and then also in walking speed and a reduction in Parkinson's symptoms. And also they found some improvement in depression, so less depression and better thinking. So one of the great things about exercise is the broad effects, right? It can be good for the motor system and the non-motor symptom. So when you hear your, you know, when you hear about the motor symptoms of uh, bradykinesia and rigidity associated with Parkinson's, <laughs> And then also the non-motor symptoms, things like depression and thinking, this kind of exercise, aerobic exercise, is really good for that. You can see improvements in those areas. That's what I mean about choosing the type of exercise based on your profile or based on each individual's symptoms and challenges. So this was a study done fairly recently looking at the difference between high intensity walking and moderate intensity walking. A lot of people ask, well, how hard do I have to work? You know, what is the upper, is there an upper limit? Is more better? You know, what, what do we know about that? So in this particular trial, there were 126 people newly diagnosed with Parkinson's and they hadn't started on medicines yet. And, and there were three groups. One group just continued with usual care right? Nothing, no, no exercise. Another group participated in walking on a treadmill four days a week at 60 to 65% heart rate max, which is essentially moderate intensity, a little bit out of breath. And then that was compared to high intensity. So four days a week at 80 to 85% heart rate max. So that's really out of breath, really work, working hard. And so in, in this, in this, uh, figure right here, you can see the heart rate range was high here, tightly titrated in this group. And then there's a moderate intensity. Their heart rate was down here around 60 to 65. So you can see the difference between the two groups here. And then one of the things they looked at was how many days a week that people adhered to the program. Well, the moderate intensity, people in general averaged 3.2 days a week of exercise. That was a little easier than the high intensity group that averaged 2.8 days a week. So people tended to exercise more when it was moderate intensity, just a little bit. And so what did they find in this study? So here is usual care over here. Here's the results for moderate intensity and here is high intensity. And this over here is the motor signs of Parkinson's. You know, when you go to the neurologist and they do this, these kinds of things here, that's what that score is, okay? The, the Parkinson's motor symptom. And so what happened here was the people who got usual care or no exercise had the greatest amount of decline. You know, they had declined about three points in six months, okay? The people who had who engaged in moderate exercise declined by just, just under two points. And the people who engaged in high intensity exercise uh, you know, had, a, had a decline in about a half a point. And so the only significant difference now between the two groups was high and usual care. There was no actual significant difference between high intensity and moderate intensity when they were directly compared. However, this suggests that there might be an added benefit of high intensity. And so now what is happening in the field is that there's a big next trial. So there's now a study that's going on that's just starting to launch around the country in the, in the United States and in Canada. And the goal of that study is to compare the high intensity with the moderate intensity aerobic exercise. It's a more definitive study. There's gonna be 370 people uh, that are gonna be enrolled in this study. 
and I, <clears throat> so, it, you know, in 25 different sites across the United States and Canada. So this is a major advancement in the field. We're going to really understand, you know, much more in terms of the benefits, you know, is it, you know, how important is it to exercise at a high intensity? I can tell you that both intensities, moderate and high, have many of the same benefits. Improvements in walking, improvements in, in balance, improvements in thinking. The big question is, is there an added advantage of high intensity when it comes to the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease? And so what we're not sure about is whether the exercise actually has a symptomatic effect. So just like, just like the medicines you take, just like the dopamine, the dopamine reduces the symptom, but it doesn't change the symptoms, right? It doesn't, the symptoms are still, are still, the disease is still progressing, but the medicines do a great job of controlling the symptoms. And what we're trying to understand about exercise is we know that does the same thing. We know exercise controls the symptom. What we don't know is if it slows down the progression of the disease. And that's what we're trying to figure out with this big trial that's going to happen starting this spring. So a lot of people ask me about, well, what's better, walking or cycling? Does it matter? And here's the answer. There was just a, a study done with cycling, uh, and, and this was done in the Netherlands, the Park and Shape study. And there was about 130 people in here, and they compared a, uh, a cycling to a stretching group. And what I wanna show you here is the comparison from the study I just shared with you, that high intensity versus moderate intensity treadmill training. And now we have the cycling study and the results are pretty similar, are pretty similar. So that means that they're, they're, it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to matter whether it's cycling or high intent, you know, or, or, or moderate or high intensity walking on a treadmill both are effective. So then how do you know what to pick? Well, you pick what you like, right? What you're most, you're most likely to do. You know, if you'd rather walk, then go for it, right? You can pick walking because you know you're gonna get that benefit. If you prefer cycling, a stationary cycle, you can do that. Here's another thing to think about. Probably the walking on the treadmill is gonna also have added benefits related to walking bigger steps, you know, faster walking speed. So if your goal is to have, to have aerobic exercise so that you can have those changes in the brain, plus an effect on walking outcomes, improving your walking, then treadmill training might be the better choice. But if you have trouble falling, you trouble with your balance, you have freezing of gait, for example, it might be very difficult and maybe unsafe to walk on a treadmill. And then biking, the cycle, the cycling offers an alternative form of aerobic exercise that's just as effective. So that's good news. All right, so let's move on to strengthening. Okay, so we know that strengthening is beneficial to improve strength, right, in everybody. What's so special about it in Parkinson's disease? Well, this was a study done over two years, right? So there were people with Parkinson's disease that participated in a progressive strengthening program over a two year period. And that was compared to an exercise program that was sort of, that wasn't progressed. It was, it was just, um, you know, sort of the same exercise program that was done, you know, at the same frequency over two years, but it wasn't progressed. It wasn't made more challenging. And this study showed that at the end of two years here, that UPDRS, that, that, that test with the neurologist does with the, the slowness and the rigidity, that, that there was a significant difference between groups at the end of two years. The group that got the progressive strengthening program had a significantly greater reduction in those motor symptoms compared to the people who did a strengthening program that wasn't progressed. It was the same all the time. So what this tells us is that it is really important strengthening, let me say one more thing about it. The, the advantage of strengthening is that it helps people with Parkinson's disease 
overcome some of the bradykinesia, the slowness of moving. So strengthening helps move, helps people move faster, turn their muscles on faster, and have greater force output, more strength, right, to contribute to the to a certain movement. And so, but what's important is the strengthening has to be progressed. So that means it has to be a little bit harder over time. That could mean a little more weight. It could mean a little, a few more repetitions, you know. And this is where it's helpful to talk to a physical therapist about how to progress a particular strengthening program. So then what muscles are important to strengthen? What are the key muscles that should be targeted in people with Parkinson's disease? I'm gonna show you a picture here. So these, this picture of these exercises is in the American Parkinson's Disease Association Be Active booklet. I have a slide on that at the end that I'll share with you. But you can go on the APDA, the American Parkinson's Disease Association's website, and you can download this exercise program for free. So what you see here is, this is a simple standing up and just an exercise that doesn't require any fancy equipment, no weights, no gym, just the act of standing up from a chair and then sitting back down. So it's like a squat, standing up and sitting down. Those target all the big muscles, the big extensor muscles in the legs, the, the, leg, the, the thigh muscles in the front and the back and in the buttocks. And those are really important for people with Parkinson's disease to keep people more upright, right? And, and, and standing up taller, very important. Okay, then we have uh, exercises that focus on improving range of motion or flexibility. And this is particularly important for people who experience a lot of stiffness or, or pain or muscle you know, an uncomfortable feeling in, in, in the joints, for example. And here's a picture from that same APDA booklet of the particular areas, the particular muscle groups and the joints that should be targeted in people with Parkinson's disease. You can see here, this targets the hamstrings or the muscles in the back of the thigh, which can get tight because of shorter steps with walking. So this helps target a particular muscle that we often see tight. Many of you are probably familiar with this runner stretch, is getting the calf in the back here. That's also important in Parkinson's disease. This position here, the, the muscles in the front of the hip here are getting stretched. And that is often a problem in Parkinson's disease with a forward posture. When people are more sort of hunched forward, those muscles can get very tight. So, you know, people that have that kind of stiffness or uh, any kind of pain or uncomfortableness or uh, limited, you know, flexibility, this could be an important, um, you know, part of the exercise program. Okay, balance. Balance is so important, right? We know that in Parkinson's disease, balance can be affected. And ultimately, you know, people can experience falling. And we wanna to try to be proactive and do what we can to improve balance. So the good thing about this is there's lots of options. There was a big study done in Tai Chi several years ago with almost 200 people with Parkinson's disease, comparing Tai Chi to strengthening to stretching twice a week for an hour over six months. And basically the improvements in balance were greatest with Tai Chi compared to the other uh, types of, of exercise. Basically, this, there's something called a specificity of training effect. So if you train muscles to get stronger, you want to do strengthening exercise, if that's the goal, right? If you want to improve balance, you want to challenge balance. And something like Tai Chi is better for that. So it's you sort of want to pick the exercise based on the outcome or the overall goal that you're trying to achieve. There was also a significant lower fall rate in people that participated in Tai Chi compared to the other groups. That makes sense because Tai Chi focuses more on balance than the other exercise choices. But if I was to measure strength, then the resistance training group would have come out on top, right? So it depends what it is you're actually measuring. And then those people who love to dance. Dancing has been studied uh, pretty widely. 
and particularly tango. Uh, this is a study where over 60 people with Parkinson's participated in tango for over a year. So twice a week for over a year. And there was an improvement in those motor signs and in balance and walking and, and better quality of life and less freezing of gait. So not only is dancing fun, but it also has a significant benefit on some of the key symptoms of Parkinson's disease. All right, now I, I, I bring this study forward because this was a large study with over 200 people in that this was done in Australia. And the key here is that this was balance exercises that were done for 45 minutes to 60 minutes, three times a week for six months. And the primary outcome here was falls. The idea was to see if balance training could reduce falls. And I think that people sometimes have in their mind that you don't need to work on balance until later, you know, until falls start happening. And what this study found is that the people who had the biggest benefit in terms of improving balance and reducing falls were people earlier on people that were just either just starting to have those problems early on and not waiting too long. So you can see here, these are the people that had sort of, that were earlier on in the disease. Those people that participated in exercise had, had 99 falls over the course of six months. The people who didn't exercise had 435 falls. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. So what this study suggests is start early, be proactive, right? Do your balance exercises. You don't have to wait to have balance problems. You don't have to wait to have falling. You wanna start early. Okay. And then this one might not be as intuitive to folks, but um, what the literature suggests is that task specific practice is very important and has an impact on the brain. And so what we often do in physical therapy is we figure out what are the tasks that people have problems with? Is it walking? Is it standing up from a chair? Is it moving in bed? You know, and then we develop a, a, a training program to improve those tasks. So in this slide, this is in animal models. This is in mice. And what we see here is with training, with task-specific training, there are more of these synapses that form on neurons. With no training, those, syn those synapses go away. They can be eliminated. So what this means is that the skill training, the practice of the tasks helps increase those synapses on a neuron, which makes the neuron more robust, easier to communicate, better movement, it enhances that particular task, right? So here's the evidence that we use to base that, the base that program on. So here's a gentleman with Parkinson's disease. He's 80 years old. And you can see him walking here on the left. And his walking is somewhat slow, right? And what we did here is to practice walking, we use music. And so at, and for him. Okay, turn around right there, Walter, and do that again. He did the best at 116 beats per minute, which means he'll walk 116 steps a minute. So can you see the difference there? He's walking to a beat, practicing the Both time arms. walking, and you see he's much faster. His arms are swinging, his steps are bigger. What's my video right? tape? Music is a nice way to do that because in Parkinson's disease, one of the things that happens is something called a lack, a, a la, a lack of um, automaticity. So those of you with Parkinson's might experience this and, and think, well, I can think about walking and improve my walking, but if I don't think about it, it doesn't happen automatically. Then I start to shuffle, walk slower, but when I start to think about it, I can make the walking better. Well, the problem is, is that you can't go around thinking about walking all day, right? That would be exhausting. And you're trying to do other things. You're trying to have a conversation or do other things, right? 
And so music can take the place of the circuits in the brain that are, that are affected in Parkinson's disease that take away that automaticity. When you use music, people can entrain to the beat. Have you ever noticed in your life when you've walked to music or maybe you've run to music, you automatically entrain, right? Or lock on to the beat without even thinking about it. And so when one song changes to the next song, you automatically just start entraining or locking on to the beat or the tempo of that song without thinking about it. So we use music a lot to try to improve the quality of walking in people with Parkinson's disease. We're working with a company now and we're just embarking on a study in which they have developed a particular algorithm that, we are gonna, that we're gonna use to try to improve walking. So we put this sensor here on the shoe that measures how many steps per minute a person takes. And then we have a, a, a smartphone here that houses all different kinds of genres of music, any kind of music that you would like to walk to, something that you like and enjoy. And when, when this, this, when the, what the phone can do is then detect the number of steps that that person is walking and then play a song that is specifically tailored to that person's cadence or their walking tempo. And so if a person is walking slowly, you, that, that algorithm will then play a song at a certain rhythm, at a certain cadence, at a certain tempo. And then the, pay, the, the person wearing the device will lock on to that, start walking at that pace. And then the algorithm speeds up the music. So the tempo gets a little quicker of the same song that you're listening to. And you might not even pick it up. You might not even notice it, but it, it quickens the cadence so that then the person automatically starts walking faster. And so we're doing a study this spring, looking at this to see if this is an option. This could be a great option for people to do at home. You would go see a physical therapist. They would show you how to use this make sure it all works, you know, time it to your specific profile of gait, and then set it up ready to go, you know, so that it can be used at home. It's a great idea. We'll, we're, we're, we'll, we'll be, I'll be sharing the results hopefully sometime next year. And so you can see here, look what happens. See these steps on the top? These are steps in a person with Parkinson's disease without music. They're kind of chaotic. They're asymmetrical. If with music, you see how the steps are now very symmetrical and very rhythmic and very even. So we can really make a difference in the quality of walking with the music. Okay, another question I get from people is how much exercise do I have to do? And so I put together this table here. This is sort of you know what's generally recommended, but the aerobic exercise, you know, the walking on the treadmill or the cycling. Basically, the studies show that 30 minutes, three days a week gets you the benefits. So a half hour, three days a week. If you think about it, that's not too bad, right? That's only an hour and a half a week out of all the hours that there are, right? The strengthening exercise is generally done two to three days a week for about a half an hour. Now, I, you, you, the flexibility exercise, that can be done two to three days a week, but a lot of people do flexibility exercises 10 or 15 minutes every day, helps people loosen up. And then the balance exercises are two to three days a week for about a half an hour. Now you might say, well, if you add all that up, that's a lot. Well, a physical therapist can help you design an exercise program in which one exercise achieves both goals, two goals, let's say. For example, um, there's exercises that can work on strengthening and balance at the same time. So it's a twofer. You can do one exercise and check off two different buckets. That's what we try to do when we develop an exercise program is to make it really efficient. How can we give you sort of the least amount of things to do that give you the, be the best sort of bang for your buck to make it the most efficient and most beneficial? Okay, 
So we all know regular exercise matters. Sometimes people say, well, how long do I have to do all this exercise? And the answer, the truth is forever, right? For the long haul. We know that after, you know, if you stop the exercise, then you lose the benefits. That happens to everybody. In this study of people with Parkinson's disease, people exercised 150 minutes per week. So that's a half hour, five days a week, compared to no exercise or low exercise, the couch potato, right? And after one year, when they looked at the difference between the two groups, those people with Parkinson's disease that were regular exercisers had better quality of life, better mobility, better function, better thinking, and less disease progression one year later. So those people with Parkinson's who exercise have better outcomes. And this was done in over 2000 people with Parkinson's. Okay, so you might say to me, well, this is all great. I know how good exercise is, I'm with you. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I buy into all this. I see the evidence. I, I want to do it, but I'm not that good at doing it when it comes down to the actual moment, right? Well, I hear that from a lot of people. And so, what gets in the way? Well, sometimes people don't have the confidence, or they don't know what to do, or they're busy, or they don't know how to fit it in. Some people tell me they don't like it. Uh, they're like, oh, the treadmill. The swear master, you know, get a personal drainer, the Nordic trick, I, you know, people, not everybody sort of gravitates naturally to exercise. So what can we do? Well, sometimes our thoughts can get in the way. When we think about what, what gets in the way, you know, if we want to be doing this, what gets in the way? So how many of you experience this? We, we call them thinking traps and stuff that runs through your mind that can get, that can sort of talk you out of exercising. Does this ever happen to you that, oh, you might say to yourself, we call this an all or nothing thinking trap. Since I didn't exercise for the last three days, there's no point in doing it at all. Like, oh, forget it. You know, those of you that have ever been on a diet, oh, I just broke my diet. I had an ice cream, forget it. No point in going on, you know, I, I, I didn't do it. Um, and, and we know that's not true. You know, I mean, there's, you have a whole lifetime and if you miss three days, so what? Get back on, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you're still gonna get a lot of benefit from re-engaging. You know, if you miss a week, a month, get back on it. You know, you can benefit a lot from, from just, you know, sort of jumping back on. You know, uh, you know, people say things like, oh, I've never been in much of an exercise or I'm really not good at it. Well, you can get good at it. You can be good at it, right? If you take a walk, you're an exerciser, right? You're, you're, you're now an exerciser and you're a successful one. Um, you know, if I don't get back to my exercise program today, I probably never will, right? Well, those kinds of thinking can get in the way and they're, it's, they're actually not true. Right? It's not based on the evidence. We know that if you take a few days off and you get back on track, you're going to have benefits. So what should we do? Well, let's make it fun. You know, how do we make it fun? And one of the things is there's so many choices. Those charts I saw you saw I, I shared with you earlier, look at all the choices. Right? Look at all the choices. Tai Chi and dance and you know and the and cycling and the treadmill and walking outside and lots of choices. You can't go wrong. The other thing that I think really helps people who struggle with exercise is to have a personal goal. What is, why do you want to exercise? Well, the big, big picture goal is because you want to be able to do the things in life that you want to do. You know, maybe you want to travel or that was maybe before COVID. Uh, or maybe you want to play with your grandchildren. Maybe you want to play golf. Maybe you want to, you know, um, you know, socialize, do all the things you've always wanted to do in retirement, for example. And so having that personal goal in mind can be really motivating in terms of participating in exercise. So what we suggest is that people set goals, real specific goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely goals. We call them SMART goals. How many have you ever, how many of you have ever said, I'm going to start exercising next week? For sure, 
right? Definitely, no question about it next week. That is so vague, right? That it doesn't hold you accountable, right? That could mean anything. So we suggest more specific action planning. Who are you gonna exercise with? What kind of exercise are you gonna do? When specifically are you gonna do it? Where are you gonna do it? I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna go for a walk with my spouse Monday morning at 10 a.m. That is much more likely to happen than I'm gonna start exercising next week. The other thing is that people need to experience success. All the stuff I've been showing you about all this exercise, you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to do all of this all at once. You can start with small bits, small pieces. And you once you see that you can do it and you feel good and you're successful at it, that will lead to the next step, adding a little bit more. So start small. You know, some people really enjoy exercising with your care partner. Care partners need to exercise too. Care partners need to be strong and robust and, you know, be able to do all the things that they need to do. So sometimes, you know, planning with your care partner, let's, let's, let's do these balance exercise. Let's do a Tai Chi class together. Let's take a walk. All those things can hold you more accountable. And then like Sal was saying earlier, you know, his wife participates in rock steady boxing or a boxing class. All these kinds of community-based classes, boxing, Tai Chi, dancing, cycling. Some of the YMCAs have cycling now for people with Parkinson's disease. These have the added benefit of socialization, meeting other people with Parkinson's disease and establishing that camaraderie. You're all in it together, you know, and it also holds you accountable. You're much more likely to show up to a class and then just do it then sort of left to your own. And then team sports. You know, you're, it, it's never too late to participate in team sports. Team sports takes your mind off exercising, right? You're just, you're trying to get the basketball in the, in the hoop. You know, you're trying to win the game, you know, and, and you're, you're doing a lot of, you can, you know, whatever the team sport is, you can be addressing a lot of the things that we want to address in people with Parkinson's disease. You know, some people do really well with some sort of feedback. There's all kinds of trackers now, Fitbits and Apple Watches and all of these kinds of things that, you know, can, can give you the feedback and progress towards your goals. And for a lot of people, that is really beneficial. Some of these watches and, 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 and other digital, uh, you know, kind of wearables provide rewards. This is one of my favorites. You earn the bare minimum badge. You did the bare minimum amount of walking today that is necessary to get a reward. So one thing I recommend when you, if you get one of these watches or you use one of the you know, Fitbit or some sort of watch, instead of having an absolute target, I'm gonna walk 7,000 steps or 10,000 steps or 5,000 steps, give yourself a range. I'm going to walk at least 5,000, but I'm going to shoot for 6,000. But as long as I'm in that range, I got the bare minimum. I did it, you know, so that you don't feel like you have to do a, a, an exact amount. Sometimes that can be very helpful. We're doing a lot of research with mobile health technology. People, have, people are much more likely to have smartphones. So we're doing a study in which people come into our clinic and we set them up on an exercise program that we video. We video the exercises. Then we send people home with this app on their phone and they open the app and they see themselves doing the exercises and they can exercise right along with the video. And then we ask people to fill in data just to indicate if the exercise was hard or easy or painful or painless. And the physical therapist can monitor that data remotely. And then we can make changes to the program, to the exercise program, remotely without having to have people come in. And this makes it much easier to stay connected to the physical therapist and to have your exercise program adapted to meet your needs. And then motivation. So sometimes the rewards and things like that are good at the beginning to provide extrinsic motivation. But the best motivation of all to exercise is intrinsic motivation. And that comes from feeling good. That comes from actually 
feeling the benefits of exercise yourself. And in order for that to happen, you got to stick to it. It takes a couple of months of continuous exercise, regular exercise, for you to see the benefit, for you to really realize it in your day-to-day -day life. So that's something to keep in mind. Another thing that's really helpful is to make exercise a habit. Like build it in. You know, if I, um, you know, it, you, don't, you don't think about like sort of brushing your teeth every day. You don't go in the bathroom and say, geez, should I brush my teeth today or should I take the day off? All right, you just brush your teeth. It's part of your morning routine. It's a habit. And if you make exercise a habit, build it into your routine. Every day after breakfast, I go for a walk. That's my routine. Before I sit down and read the paper, I go for a walk and I make that part of my routine. It is more likely to happen. If you have to decide if you're gonna exercise, you have to overcome that indecision. Those thinking traps that can get in your head, get in the way, right? And so making it a habit can really help. One of the things we recommend in our center, we see people for physical therapy every six months for a follow-up visit, for a check-in. We call it the dental model. You know how you go to see the dentist every six months, whether you need it or not? You know, if you go and they say, hey, you look great, no problems. Great. That's a successful visit, right? If you go and you're starting to have balance problems and the physical therapist picks up on that, they can adjust your exercise program accordingly to take a more preventative approach, staying on top of the changes that are occurring rather than waiting you know, for a big decline to occur and then try to intervene. So we really feel like partnering with a physical therapist, just, be, just like you go to see the neurologist every six months for a medication adjustment, it's helpful to go see a physical therapist every six months or so for an exercise adjustment. Here's the booklet I was talking about earlier. You can go on the APDA website and download this booklet for free with all the exercises in it. If you have any questions for me or our team, we have a, a toll-free exercise helpline, a phone number, and we have an email, rehab at bu.edu, and we have physical therapists answering these messages. So if you have any questions about anything today, you can feel free to, uh, to give us a call. Right now, we're also doing telemedicine visits. Uh, so we can see anybody anywhere, which is a great advantage uh, of this particular challenging time. There's always an upside. Here's our team. I, I couldn't do uh, all the work we do without my amazing, amazing team of, uh, of physical therapists and future physical therapists. So. I just wanna thank you uh, for your time and I hope this has been helpful. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Ellis. Great presentation. We do have a few questions for you today. This first one, I believe you went over um, in the latter part of your presentation, but this individual is asking about the most helpful exercise for balance and posture. Yeah. So working on balance is very, very important, but there doesn't seem to be one type of balance training that's better than another. So for example, participating in dance, Tai Chi, those kinds of things were equally as beneficial. And so that means you get to pick. The most important thing is that you address balance, that you do some sort of exercise that helps improve balance but because there's no advantage to one over another, you can actually choose which one you like the best. Wonderful, thank you. This individual is asking about managing exercise timing when they're having significant off periods throughout the day. Great question. It is best to exercise during an on time. You're gonna get the most out of your exercise program when you're on, when the medications are working the best. So to the extent that you can predict that, that helps to build it in. I'm gonna take my medicines at this time. Usually I feel my best 30 minutes later or whatever it is. That's when I'm gonna do my exercise program. That's a really, really good question. Thank you. This person's asking, is it too late to do balance training if you're already falling? Never too late, never too late. There are advantages of doing balance training at all times. I wanted to make the point that people often just do it later. And you, sh you should do it later, but you should also do it earlier. 
you know, so the whole time is a really, really important. So yes, it's never too late. Always a good idea. Thank you. This person asks, I'm having trouble walking even with the aid of a walker. What exercises would be good to do instead? Yeah, this is where seeing a physical therapist would be very beneficial because it depends on your own, your unique walking problem. You know, people that are walking using a walker can be using that for different reasons. So we need to understand, is it some particular, like what particular aspect of walking is problematic or is it a balance issue? Is it a strength issue? You know, so have it going to a physical therapist and getting a specific exam and saying, hey, what are the best kind of exercises I need to do, you know, to, make, to get my walking better? Very important. Great, thank you. This person's asking about the exercise within your PowerPoint, the sitting exercise. And they're asking, how do you keep the person from falling forward? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's important to be able to adapt all these exercises, you know, to meet the needs of, a, of, a, of each person. So, you know, what I showed there is for somebody that doesn't have a problem, you know, uh, falling forward. But the exercise, these exercises can be adapted. In the, in the Be Active booklet that I mentioned, there are different levels of exercise. So we show, in, in, in those pictures, we usually show like three different ways you can do it, you know, and that can be helpful. Uh, but the other thing is to really to go to see a physical therapist and get an individualized program to make sure you're doing it safely. The last thing we want is for people to fall and get hurt trying to exercise. So that's why it's so important to make sure you're doing the exercise that's best for you. It's tailored to your, you know, presentation and the challenges that you face. Wonderful. Thank you. We have a couple of questions, um, so I'll kind of condense it into one about motivating their, their person with PD who either has apathy, depression, or is reluctant to engage in exercise. Yep, I, I hear that a lot. And so I think that um, the best thing to do is to agree ahead of time on a schedule, not in the moment. It's very difficult in the moment to get somebody uh, to do something you know, when they're depressed or, or, or have lack of motivation, apathy, those kinds of things. But ahead of time saying, okay, you know, every day after breakfast, you know, we're going to take a walk. That's going to be our usual routine. That can sometimes work. It's, it's, you know, you've discussed it ahead of time, you agree to that, and then it's just part of the routine. That's, it becomes a day-to-day -day sort of habit rather than waiting for each day to happen and trying to get your spouse uh, to go out and exercise, you know, when they don't feel like it and don't have that motivation. And so, you know, that's it, trying to build it into the kind of daily schedule and making it as automatic as possible. It takes the decision making out of it. When there's decision making and you have to say, should I exercise or shouldn't I? Then that's when it's less likely to happen when someone's depressed and apathetic. But if you've, if you've set a schedule, most of the time, people who are apathetic will go along with it. Uh, they're not resistant. You know, that apathy doesn't make people resistant. It just makes people not motivated to initiate, uh, you know, engagement in an activity. So trying to do that, trying to make it part of the schedule, a habit, a regular part of one's day can help. Wonderful. Also, Thanks. another thing that can help is going to a class. You know, engaging in a class can be helpful. It's with other people, there's camaraderie, uh, you know, you kind of follow along with whatever the leader of the class is telling you what to do, you know, and that can be a lot easier than initiating it yourself. Perfect, thank you. Um, can a physical therapist help with specific issues that someone is having with movement, like moving in bed? Absolutely. That's one of the things the physical therapist can help with the most, you know, is this task specific training that we talked about. Analyzing movement, what physical therapists do best is analyze movement, like moving in bed, like standing up from a chair, like walking, determining what the underlying problems are, and then treating, you know, giving a, a, a treatment plan that's going to help people move in bed, in this case, better. There's lots of different ways people can move in bed that might make it a lot easier. And so, Going to see a physical therapist specifically to ask about that is a great idea. 
Wonderful, thank you. And one final question. Is there evidence that exercising in the later stages of Parkinson's can improve rather than just delay the progression of symptoms? It depends on what they are. You know, it depends on the type of symptoms. You know, stuff like, um, you know, range of motion and stiffness, that can improve. Um, sometimes strength can improve. So, um, you know, it, it really depends. So there is that, there, you know, and it, and it depends on that person's uh, specific circumstances. But, you know, I would sort of come at, come at it from an optimistic point of view. And that's what, that's what going to a physical therapist can really help with too. You know, how can I, you want, when you go to see a physical therapist, what's really helpful is if you go in with your goals. This is what I want to achieve. This is what's really bothering me. This is what I'd like to get out of these sessions. And so that it's very clear, and then the physical therapist can really work towards that and help you get there. Wonderful, thank you. And, and I will just quickly answer, there's a couple questions relating to your PowerPoint specifically. Yeah. Um, and yes, Dr. Ellis has graciously offered um, to be willing to share her PowerPoint. So thank you for will, those questions, I will questions, absolutely everyone. do that. I will email it to you after this meeting today and you can feel free to distribute it to the group. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ellis. We really appreciate your time. Um, we are going to go into now talking with, thank you, talking with Ellen Schaller, who is our care advisor. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about care advising through NeuroChallenge and how that can help you utilize some of the suggestions here by Dr. Ellis today. And thank you all for inviting me. It was an absolute privilege to be here, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Ellis. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chelsea. Like she said, I'm Ellen Schaller. I'm one of the care advisors at NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's. And we've just heard many ways that regular exercise positively affects Parkinson's disease and what studies have shown us, the benefits of targeted PT and OT when you need it, and the benefits of socialization. So to help you with all of these objectives, the care advising team at NeuroChallenge Foundation has compiled a list of local exercise resources, which will be emailed to each of you. Please contact the providers listed on that exercise list for updated and changing information due to the COVID restrictions. There are also two takeaways from today's session that you will also receive by email. One is a complimentary fitness and balance assessment by Elizabeth Goldsmith of Suncoast Fit Life. And the other is a complimentary initial assessment, including balance and flexibility provided at Health Fit, which is the wellness facility that is part of Sarasota Memorial. So let's talk about care advising at NeuroChallenge Foundation. Our mission at NeuroChallenge Foundation is to improve the quality of life of those with Parkinson's and their care providers. And we do that three ways, through education, support group, and care advising. There are three of us who work as care advisors. You've met Chelsea, our senior care advisor, Stacy Carlin, and then myself. And we serve six counties in Florida, and each of us are responsible for specific areas. However, since we're virtual, Right now, we are serving people all over, and there are no boundaries at all for the people that we're serving. We talk to people from all over the country, and we assist them in finding resources in their local areas. So what exactly is care advising? Well, first of all, we, are not, we do not offer or provide any medical treatment or medical advice, so we are not a clinical organization but we do provide resources and recommendations in the community. Let me give you some examples. And, and Dr. Ellis referred to so many of these. It's, it's a wonderful segue for me. Um, we can provide resources for some of those local um, exercise programs that she referred to, rock steady boxing, pedaling with Parkinson's. So we can give you specific locations of where those things are happening. Right now, though, I wanna make sure you all understand, since we are virtual, all three of us also have listing of online exercise resources specific to rock steady boxing um, and other Parkinson's exercise classes. We also have lots of information on the big and loud. 
which again, Dr. Ellis referred to, these are the um, typically outpatient, but they can be provided in the home. These are one-on-one -on -one therapies um, that are provided. Big is speech, excuse me, occupational and physical therapy and loud is speech therapy. And these are Parkinson's specific um, exercise programs. We can have, we provide resources on transportation services. Right now, a big request from people is about companion and personal care um, agencies. So this is unskilled agencies in the community that can help provide assist for caregivers for their loved ones with Parkinson's. We have resources on mental health um, and many more things. So we have all kinds of resources in the community. We provide individual support to help folks navigate the complexities of managing PD. We can help to explain or help people understand the various motor and non-motor symptoms of the disease and how they affect everyday life and the stresses that they can cause. So currently all of our offices are closed. So we are doing all of our care advising sessions over the phone, over Zoom, over Google Meet, whatever works for the individual. Our goal is to connect with our PD community and provide support in whatever way possible, either locally or via the internet for those outside our areas. Another aspect that we do as care advisors is we facilitate programs and support groups. And support groups are definitely the largest part of the groups that we do. We have various support groups. We have designated every Thursday morning to be a support group time at NeuroChallenge Foundation. So every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, <laughs> we have a support group for care partners or caregivers. And at 1130, we follow that with a support group for people with Parkinson's. So every Thursday morning, one of the three of us is on Zoom at 10 o'clock for the care providers or care partners and at 1130 for the people with Parkinson's to have a support group. And then we also have monthly men with Parkinson's support group, women with Parkinson's support group, and also combined support group for both the care partners and the people with Parkinson's. And like most support groups, our support groups are confidential. So what is shared in the group stays in the group. We also facilitate our therapeutic and education programs. And let me give you some examples. Our therapeutic programs are wide and vast. We have dance, we have yoga, we have creative writing, we have creative arts, and laughter are just some examples. And then regarding educational programs, we've recently had a mental health series as well as a complementary health series as part of our educational groups. So again, currently, we are completely virtual. So all of our programs are virtual and we are doing over 50 monthly programs. We are, provide, we are able to provide, whether we're in person or virtual, we are able to provide all of our services at NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's free of charge to our community. And that is because of the generosity of our donors, of our virtual sponsors who are doing webinars for, for us, typically on Mondays around noon. And also another way that we can do this is through our community partner relationships. So to contact us, the best way, obviously neurochallenge.org is our website, or as you can see on the slide, you can call 941-926-6413 for a care advising appointment. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ellen. What, uh, what a great detailed explanation of everything we do at NeuroChallenge. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate that all of our services, programs, care advising are for free to our community. And because of being on Zoom, no boundaries. So I know a lot of you are Zooming in from other areas than our typical six counties. We thank you so much for joining us today. We thank you for the sponsorship um, that we've had today that made it possible for us to do our presentation. Let me just go back to that from Supernus Pharmaceuticals. And we thank the care partners who put their time, energy, effort, and thought into this presentation today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. 
Hopefully you will join us for the remaining three sessions where we're going to be learning about financial planning, about estate planning, and about our VA benefits. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful afternoon.